Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. I am here today to record one of our first lectures for um, policing practices in context, which is pretty much basically called Why Policing Practices in Context. Very simple. So the reason, the main reason why we do this particular unit is in a couple of the other units, um, Intro to Policing or What is Policing uh, and 109, you learn about the different parts uh, of policing and how policing works and you learn about uh, the different areas that policing happens in and all of those types of things. But in this unit, we genuinely start to question the way that policing happens and we challenge the different impacts that uh, policing has on communities as well as individuals. So that's why we're doing this particular unit. It always helps, of course, to start by defining policing. Um, we need to think about this in terms of distinguishing, firstly, between the institution of the police and the various activities that um, are involved in policing work on a day-to-day -day basis with officers. It's generally focused on law enforcement and peacekeeping, but it's done by a blend of different people now where we've got policing doing this work, but citizens also work towards these types of, um, these forms of regulation, I suppose, through what processes that we call pluralisation. So we see um, security staff doing a lot of policing work, who are, you know, they're not police, obviously. We see a lot of citizens doing surveillance work and neighbourhood watch, that sort of stuff, reporting back to police. So we, we're seeing a little bit of um, flexibility coming into that role and a lot of other people are now can now be engaged in um, different forms of policing functions. Policing is, however, for this unit defined as a set of functions and processes that form a subset of organised forms of social control. This includes individuals and organisations involved in regulatory, investigation and enforcement activities, part of whose defining purpose is to apply social controls. And of course, we can definitely see uh, security personnel and the ways in which their work falls within that um, definition. So Roe has a whole range of different ways of thinking about how we define policing. It's uh, law enforcement and crime fight fighting approaches that see crime generally as a threat um, and police are the first responders that uh, attempt to resolve different forms of crime and we see this real sort of realistic law enforcement crime fighting approach very much in the media. This is the main way that we see policing happen in, um, in media representations. Police very much have a monopoly on the use of force. However, that does seem to be working into other areas such as security personnel as well. But police have the monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Their capacity of um, the police to use force is what distinguishes them from the broader community, I suppose. So they can technically kidnap somebody, so taking them under arrest, taking them down to police station, and they're allowed to do that uh, legally. Policing is also service-oriented work and general order maintenance. So broad, what we call broader social regulation, I suppose. There's very little enforcement of um, criminal law, um, according to the research ev evidence, uh, it's generally sort of, oh, look, you know, that's fine, don't do it again, giving people warning or caution or whatever. And there's a lot of patrol work involved in that more service-oriented um, and order maintenance uh, work. So that's a very specific type of policing that we probably don't see as much in media representations. There's a little bit of it, certainly, where a police officer demonstrates care and attention to a, a particular individual or a community organisation and they um, demonstrate that in a TV show. That does happen sometimes. Policing is also about bureaucratic administration, which is looking at performance management, record keeping, form filling. Around 43% of officer time is spent in a police station and this is typically related to custody and related paperwork. 
And of course, policing is thought about as a criminal processing institution. I tend not to use the word justice because I don't really agree with your idea that it's a, gro a justice um, institution. Uh, it's one institution in a network of different criminal processing um, agencies and institutions, but it is very much the gateway to this network. Police define what it is that um, people think of as criminal activity. So I guess we kind of think about policing as a continuum of different policing styles and systems, and we'll talk about this more next week. We've got very much these sort of uh, control-dominated um, ways of thinking about it, and then we've got uh, at the main function of these being to maintain order. Crime is very much thought about as an affront to authority. Police lack legitimacy in the eyes of the community quite often because they have very um, overt um, regulation using different forms of force and coercion. Police engage in admin tasks of the state but not public service that meets the needs of the community. So it's very much about police there to enforce the law and that's it really. They're organised and managed centrally and they do have um, paramilitary characteristics. So that's very much that control-dominated idea of policing styles and systems. The community-orientated idea um, is, is quite different. The main function is to provide the community with a service and to meet community needs. And that's something that we don't often think about as police work. Crime is thought about as a symptom of community problems and these problems need to be overcome in order to make crime resolve itself. They won't need to do crime because these problems have been resolved. It assumes that people um, accord the police considerable legitimacy. So they plea they see the uh, police as legitimate and they will do as the police asks. So they might come to your door and ask questions about an offence that somebody else has been um, involved in uh, and you give them that information because you see them as a legitimate um, form of force and a legitimate institution in society. Police tend to be localised or, um, sorry, localised, organised locally, uh, but also very much localised in the way that they do their work in that community-oriented um, approach. And the barriers between police and public tend to be minimised. Now, these seem to be at opposite ends of the spectrum, but there is a lot of overlap. We'll find plenty of police organisations who do both of those things, and it just depends on their approach that they use overall as to which one, I suppose, will dominate how we think about policing. But each of these overarching styles, I suppose, influence how policing happens in different contexts and at different times and with different individuals who belong to different marginalised groups. So why are we talking about the context of policing practices? There's a whole range of different reasons, but I just wanted to touch on a few. Number one has to be because the context and the history really matters in terms of how policing unfolds and what happens. I've given a couple of images on this slide here. Um, I've given a couple of images on one of uh, these first slides that I talk about this of um, there's uh, Aboriginals who are dressed up in police uniforms. They are part of the what we call the Native Police in uh, historical Australia, um, which you would have learned about hopefully in 108. And then we've got another image on this slide where it's uh, police who are made up of the colonising um, peoples of Australia who are warring with Aboriginal people in their communities when Australia was first colonised. All of these different uh, practices with police in history between Aboriginal communities and um, police have influenced how policing happens now in the present. Uh, there were a lot of circumstances where police would go to people's houses and take away their children um, as per the discussion around stolen generations and so forth. And this, of course, influences now because these stories are passed down through the generations in families. It becomes an intergenerational narrative about policing. And there's young people now who, who are Aboriginal. They don't have contact with 
um, police very much or at all, but they know these narratives about how police have treated their families in the past. So they have uh, certain ideas about police and that influences how they interact with them. It influences whether they give police respect and then, of course, whether or not respect is reflected back from police towards them. So these types of things are absolutely vital to consider when we're thinking about policing. Some policing practices leave a lot to be desired and I have, I'm going to put up, uh, I've got on this particular slide, you can see a whole bunch of different examples. Police officers have been found to be engaged in um, uh, all manner of different illegal practices. Many people talk about how police officers reflect the greater community and they do because they, they are made up of the community members. So we have police involved in rape, in domestic violence, in murder even. Uh, they generally engage in the same practices as everybody else um, does. And there's quite a few different examples which um, I'll put up on the Milo site for you which demonstrate uh, what we're talking about here in terms of these types of things. So Oklahoma City cop was convicted of rape um, and sentenced to 263 years in prison. A Gold Coast police officer is under investigation by the Crime and Corruption Commission after a taser video went viral. A US police officer is investigated for flipping and dragging a student in the classroom. A London Metropolitan Police, P Politan police officer is being investigated um, after forcing woman released from pr prison into a relationship and taking advantage of her in that process. So all of these things have happened um, and have been uh, perpetrated by, I suppose, police officers and the officers are being investigated and so forth. But these are the reasons why we need to think about that very fine-grained context of how policing happens um, in different communities and with different people. We also need to talk about this because equitable, fair and socially just policing can be difficult to achieve and operationalise. And Jones talks about seven democratic criteria that he believes that we need to be thinking of when we're um, actioning the, way the ways in which we do policing. And these are equity, service delivery, responsiveness, distribution of power, information, redress and participation. Now, I'm not going to go through these uh, now. They're they're quite um, uh, quite uh, detailed, but I might see uh, if I can find these in one of the readings and put them up for you, so you can have a bit more of a read read of those and how they um, uh, how they are enacted in the way that policing should happen in the community. But for instance, the idea that police is a service delivery thing, it's greatly hotly debated. Even today people say no, police are about, you know, enforcing laws and all of that sort of stuff. They're not about providing a service, yet a lot of communities do tend to lean on police officers, um, mostly in terms of providing a service. So when we're thinking about equity and fairness and being socially just and all of those things and service provision, this is very much a balancing act because police have powers that protect fundamental liberties, sorry, police powers that protect fundamental liberties can also potentially severely abuse these freedoms. And that's why it's such a difficult landscape because these things are held together in tension. We've got these um, police powers that protect people's liberties and they come together with um, the use of those same powers when they need to use force in order to get a situation under control, whatever that force might be. The other thing is that a lot of policing practices, styles, approaches that are used in one particular context geographically may not be guaranteed to work in a different context um, depending on what the circumstances are. All policing practices and activities that we undertake is embedded in wider structure, um, cultures um, involved in different societies and settings. So for instance, we might have a really good PCYC 
um, program which is working really well that's bringing together police and young people in the local community here in Hobart. Um, we decide, wow, that would be so awesome. Let's try and get this um, put into place in Sudan. So we we get some money and a, uh, some sort of, you know, an Aussie grant or whatever, and we go over and we start to implement this pro program in Sudan with young people over there, only to find that the program doesn't work in the first instance because the young people there don't trust police at all because police come to their doors and they shoot their family and things like that. So they've started and funded this program, but they can't get any young people to come along to it because they don't um, have any trust uh, in police in the first instance. So these are all the reasons why we need to talk about the context of policing practices. The other reason why, of course, is because policing um, practices that specifically uh, that police engage in can profoundly shape how legitimate they are seen to be by the public. Um, and of course, we know now that good policing happens when the police um, oh, sorry, when public cooperate with police and when police are helping to support the public rather than, um, you know, always take that overarching, overbearing, dominating approach in the way that they do their work with police, uh, with the communities. So good policing happens when the public cooperate. We need to be able to provide relationships that enable or feel make the community feel empowered to cooperate with the police. And we know, of course, we've got a lot of circumstances with um, Aboriginal people in Australia where they don't trust the police and they don't feel like police are a legitimate um, power and therefore they don't cooperate with them. A good example of this would have been a very recent death in custody which was uh, Miss Do. It was, a little, it was a little while ago now but it was one of the most recent ones where it was quite clear that policing um, practices need to be needed to be uh, improved in order to get a better outcome for Miss Do because she obviously passed away and there were many points where the police could have stepped in and actually prevented that from happening and medical practitioners in this incident, not, not just police. So Birch and Harrington uh, have a great book which we'll use uh, quite a few sections from for this unit. The um, broad themes that run through the book and guide the way that they do, um, that they talk about policing work in this book, uh, they have these important concepts that they use to think about and for also doing um, police work and they underpin this unit. Humanism, where we're looking at questions of legitimacy and how this Im is impacted ne negatively by miscarriages of justice. So poor policing investigations, excessive use of force, corruption, negative um, media or you know scandals and so forth and how all of those things impact on legitimacy. Optimism, how do police do their work in a way that it tries to support this notion of a greater good? Um, how are they called on in crisis? Uh, so the focus is on the positive police role that they do in these crises as opposed to either more negative, overpowering ways that we typically think about police. Education. Is policing a profession? Um, ANZPA, A-N-Z-P-A-A, I can never remember the acronym. I apologise, folks. But if you put in A-N-Z-P-A-A, -A, it'll come straight up in Google. Uh, they definitely think that policing is a profession and that it needs to be professionalised. And at the moment, there's a national movement in Australia to try and get um, policing work um, accredited a lot by universities and so forth so that they're aligned with some sort of education and training before they go out into the real work of, work of um, policing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, progression. Police work in very complex, dynamic environments and face new, evolving challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, even new types of crime depending on the technologies and so forth. Police need dynamic approaches. More than just arresting and investigating, they have to work with communities to resolve crime and they can't do this unless they have good relationships with those communities. And, of course, diversity, which is absolutely imperative and we'll talk about a lot more um, in coming weeks. 
The only things the officers can be certain of in their role is that they, the diverse nature of their jobs won't change and the diverse nature of the communities they police also won't change profoundly. But the way that police interact with those communities can really help change their relationships and change the way that those relationships move forward into the future. Anyway, hopefully that gives you a little bit more of an understanding about the direction of the unit. I'll send notices to you every week about what you should be doing so you don't get behind. And if you've got any questions, please get in touch anytime. I hope you enjoy it. I'll chat with you all soon. See ya!